Hey guys, before the video begins, I need to let you know that uber horror stories are coming next, so don't despair. We also have the pleasure of being joined today by the Paranormal Scholar. Don't forget to watch the other half of the collaboration over on their channel at the end of this one, as you won't want to miss those truly chilling stories. Number 1 over the weekend, about 15 co-workers and myself had a company trip to the Stanley Hotel in Easts Park, known for being the Stephen King inspiration for The Shining. We took an 8pm ghost tour, where we were joined by 15 other people to get guided around the property, and told stories about its history and creepy things that are said to have happened. We were told to take lots of pictures. Many green orbs were caught in the picture, but I don't think anything is as creepy as this photo taken by my co-worker. A little girl in a hot pink dress who was definitely not on the tour. Apparently, years ago, a young girl who was about 13 at the time by the name of Lucy was squatting in the basement of the concert hall which is where this photo was taken. She was discovered upon plans to build some new construction and was forced to leave. The night got below freezing and she froze to death nearby. Everyone on my tour has vouched that this girl was not on the tour and was nowhere to be seen at any point. The man pictured is our tour guide and no one would have been in front of him. I am convinced that this is the ghost of Lucy, and if there was a time throughout the tour that I felt any strange energy or feeling, it was right there, heading down to the basement of the concert hall. Number 2 This story is one that has been passed down to me from my late grandfather. The circumstances are so unusual, so unlike anything I have ever heard, that it's been in the back of my mind for nearly 20 years, ever since it was first told to me when I was a child. My grandfather was a great talker and storyteller, in his own way, and my family agrees that he wouldn't mind if I shared it with others. The look on my grandfather's face every time he told this story, well, you could tell that it shook him up. First, I'll need to give you a little background. My grandfather was born in the early 20s in a dirt floor, two-room farmhouse in rural South Carolina, an only child of sharecroppers during the Great Depression. He was a premature baby, and his parents, already having lost one infant, were understandably protective of him. I'm sure they were relieved and very happy that he was a strong and healthy child, albeit with an incredible amount of wanderlust. Restless and energetic, he almost always finished his chores as quickly as he could, so that he could take up his little fishing rod and roam to his heart's content. Back then, even horse-drawn carts were a rarity on those long-gone dirt roads. Cars were practically unheard of in that part of the country in those days. Disliking horses, but still greatly desiring to put as much distance between home and himself as he could in the span of an afternoon, my grandfather had little choice other than to walk. And walk he did. He combed through many miles of woods, fields and swampland, barefoot as the day he came into this world, heedless of brambles or snakes. They wouldn't bother him if he didn't bother them. As much as he enjoyed it, it was a lonely business. His father, with acres of land to tend to, as well as livestock, hardly had the time to join his son on these walks. Sometimes one of the local boys would go with him, but that wasn't often. So, being practically kin to everyone within a 30 mile radius, my grandfather took up the grand old southern tradition of going visiting. One of his favourite places to go was to Uncle Peter's. Uncle Peter lived on one of those branches of the lake that stretched across a good portion of the county. It was a tiny shack, hardly more than a shanty, 
and barely big enough to fit both him and his spinster sister Henrietta, but they made do. Now, Uncle Peter loved to talk about as much as he loved to fish, so when he would spot my grandfather coming up the dirt track towards the house, he'd put whatever he was working on aside. Aunt Henrietta was prone to give him the stink eye for this, but she was fond of my grandfather too, so she never said anything. It became a tradition of sorts for my grandfather to put a spare shirt in a sack, along with a treat of some kind that his mother made, and head off for Uncle Peter's every other weekend. He did this for years, right up until he married my grandmother. Usually, it was about dark when he'd set off, meaning it was well after sunset before he got there, the distance between his house and Uncle Peter's being in the reckoning of about six or seven miles. Grandfather tended to stay through Sunday, heading home after evening supper, which tended to be on the table well after dark. Suffice to say, there wasn't much to be afraid of back then other than the local wildlife, and as I said before, as long as you minded your own business, they minded theirs. He'd been walking through the countryside at night all his life. He was comfortable, and felt very safe. As had become habit throughout the years, Grandfather kissed Aunt Henrietta goodbye, shook Uncle Peter's hand, and started home at a brisk pace. It was autumn, so the air was pleasantly cool, a welcome relief from summer's oppressively humid heat. He said that there was a full moon that night, and when he could walk out in the open, it was fairly well lit. He could easily see where he was going. The dirt track that led away from Uncle Peter's shack meandered through a bit of marshland before it ended at the wider road. Usually, he didn't take that route unless he felt like a bit of a wander, since cutting through the fields and woodland was a straighter shot back to his parents' farmhouse, and the road slithered and slunk its way around the far side of the lake before curving back in the direction of home. That night, however, with the moonlight and the refreshing nip in the wind, Grandfather felt the urge to do a bit of meandering. Turning at the end of the path, he stepped onto the road, barefoot as a jaybird, and softly whistling to himself. The route was so familiar that he hardly paid any attention to the surroundings, letting his feet do most of the work while he occupied himself with other thoughts. Before he knew it, he was approaching the lake. The water was calm that night, dark and still. He slowed down a little, wanting to watch the way the light rippled and shimmered gently. It was such a pretty sight that he nearly missed what was standing not far up the road. At first, it was just a silhouette, a tall and solid-looking shadow that seemed to be facing the water. Grandfather thought it might have been a trick of the light, initially. After all, he had walked through a cemetery once in the middle of the night, and thought he had seen a soldier riding a white horse, until he had gotten closer and realised it was just a large, dewdrop spiderweb. Yet, as he drew nearer, he realised it wasn't his eyes. There was something standing on the side of the road. In fact, it was a man. He could tell by the build, broad-shouldered and narrow at the hip. And he could tell by the clothes. Even in the moonlight, it was evident that the man wore a dark suit that did not fit him well. A shapeless hat was on his head, causing his form to appear elongated and odd-looking. From the distance of several feet, Grandfather could see the shine of good shoes, polished until they picked up the water's gleam. The man was standing close to the water, so close in fact that the waves were lapping at those expensive-looking shoes. The lake's shifting reflection softly illuminated his face, and Grandfather could make out strong features that had been weathered with time and toil. The lines around his mouth and eyes were distinctive as he smiled. That was when Grandfather realised that the man was smiling at him. In fact, the man had been staring at him just as long, or longer, as Grandfather had been doing the same. Quickly remembering his manners, he greeted the man politely. The man's expression didn't change, as his head turned to follow my Grandfather's movement until he stopped on the other side of the road. A little unnerved, my Grandfather stood awkwardly for a long moment waiting for what he thought would be the appropriate amount of time for a reply. The man didn't speak. His face never changed, 
but he slowly brought his hand up and made a beckoning motion with his fingers, silently asking my grandfather to come closer. Grandfather shook his head. No sir, I can't stay and talk. I have to get home. You have a nice night. Dipping his head, my grandfather started walking again, passing the strange man with a slightly quicker pace than he'd been walking before. Feeling that he was being watched, he stopped again a little further up the road. He turned to look back to see the man had turned around so that he was facing the direction of my grandfather, still staring at him, but now he was waist deep in the water. Confused and shocked, grandfather could only gape at the man as he stood in the lake, that same grin on his face as he lifted his hand and beckoned again. Shaking his head quickly, my grandfather repeated what he'd said before, the words out of his mouth before he could think about how weird they sounded now. No sir, I can't stay and talk, I have to get home, you have a nice night. He whipped around and started walking even faster up the road, listening for the sound of splashing or footsteps behind him. But there was nothing. And that was when it struck him. He had never heard a sound. No splash, no drip, no scuffle of shoes against dirt. Silence. Closing in on the trees, he felt a shiver run down his back as the feeling of being watched washed over him again. He froze on the spot. Everything in him was telling him to just keep walking and not to stop until he was through his mother's kitchen door. But there was an even stronger urge to turn around, to look back one more time. The compulsion was too much to resist. He turned again to look at the lake. The man was still there, only now he was further in. The water was up to his shoulders now, and he was still smiling. Even from the distance of several yards in the dark, Grandfather somehow knew the man was still smiling. There was movement, and he saw the man lift his hand a third time, motioning for him to come back, to come closer, to come into the water. Grandfather wasn't sure of which, or even if it was any of those things, and he never found out. Without a word, he turned to face the trees and walked away. He walked the several miles home, unnerved and perplexed. And for the next 80 years, until his death at the age of 91, he never figured out who the man was, why he was there, or what he wanted. Over and over again he told us that story. The encounter clearly haunted him. It haunts me. I shudder to think what would have happened had my grandfather actually gotten close to that man, or lingered by the lake that night. But the one thing that has stuck out in my mind about his experience, more than anything, is that the man stood almost neck deep in water, and didn't even make a ripple. Number 3 My mother's cousin sent her a bunch of old family pictures in the mail. My mother was so excited that we were looking through them together and she got to this one. I looked at the person in the photo confused, because I swore I knew him. Confused, I asked her who it was, and she told me that it was my great-grandpa Craig. I look back at the image and say, Oh yeah, I've met him. And she just looks at me with a face of concern. Um... He died a month after your sister was born. I look back at her and say, no, I, I've seen him before I met him. He's been at family holidays and stuff when I was younger. Mum, seriously, I know him. He's even been to this house before. And then she admitted to me that sometimes she would pick up the smell of old matches. That's what he used to smell like as he used to use them to light his cigarettes and he always smelt of them. After my mother managed to internalise what I told her, she called my grandma, who would be my great-grandfather's daughter, to tell her what I had just recounted. Overhearing part of the conversation, it really made her happy to hear that. 
but for all those years, I honestly thought it was just an old timer being ignored at a holiday or family gathering. He was always happy and smiling. And it turns out he'd been dead for at least 10 years from when I first remember seeing him. I think my young nephew saw him when he was younger too, because I do remember an instance where he was looking at the wall and having a conversation with himself. I asked him if he was talking with his puppy, who would be his grandfather who just died, and he said no, he didn't know who it was, and that he was just a nice old man. I remember getting a similar feeling that I got around my nephew that day, than when I did, when I saw him in previous instances. It's funny how it all came full circle in the end, and it really hit me. Number 4 First I will give some background on me, as to establish some basic human credibility before I recount the events that have caused me immense anxiety and depression. I am now a 21-year-old student at Long Beach State, looking to graduate in political science this coming spring. I am also an alumni member of a sorority on campus. I don't usually do drugs, but during the course of these events, I used marijuana once. In mid-January 2011, my best friend Athena and I looked to move out of the sorority house in hopes of bringing some form of normalcy back to our lives. We found an apartment for rent in our price range, $1,200 for a two-bedroom in downtown Long Beach, so we followed up and made it happen. The day after we moved in, something strange happened. I went to take my second shower since moving in, and five minutes into it was greeted by my neighbour from downstairs complaining that massive amounts of water were leaking into her unit from ours. I checked the water heater, and found water gushing from an emergency release valve on top, which is never supposed to be opened. A few weeks later, towards the end of February, I had come home from my pitiful job at a bookstore to find my roommate locked out on our second story balcony. She knocked on the glass door and I let her in. Thinking it hilarious, I asked her how long she had been locked out for. It turned out she had been there for six hours. And because her right arm was in a splint from shoulder surgery, she hadn't been able to climb down from the balcony. She had left her phone inside as she had slipped out for a cigarette. We agreed it was kind of strange, but laughed about her being stuck out there for six hours. A few days later, Athena offered me some marijuana to celebrate our new lives away from the sorority house. I decided it would be fun. I went to bed 45 minutes later, and out of nowhere I was the most terrified I have ever been in my life. I felt a strange sensation, and I had the overwhelming feeling that there was some manifestation of negative energy in my room. I could hear thoughts that were not mine and they were not pleasant. Strangely, my closed door was slamming back and forth against the frame, so I closed my windows. However, it continued. Frantically, I grabbed my phone from the windowsill so as to text Athena in the next room. My phone showed one new text, yet when I clicked the message box, there was no message. Already freaked out, this unnerved me even more. Athena told me that I needed to calm down and go to bed, so I did. The next morning when I woke up, I was convinced that last night's experiences were the result of the drugs. I brushed the bad memories aside. A few weeks went by without a vent. Then, one day whilst I was at work, I received a text from Athena saying that she was locked out on the balcony again so I left work early to go home and let her in. Yet this time was different. When I got home and let her in, she was freaked out. She told me that this time she had left the door open a few inches, but inexplicably, it had slammed shut on its own and latched right after. 
Not only was this a heavy glass door, but to activate the lock, it has to be pushed up. The weeks and months that followed were amongst the worst of my life. Any peace of mind that I had in my own bedroom was lost. When I wanted to fall asleep, strange things would start happening. My closed door would shake back and forth, and occasionally I would hear a violent bang against it. In fact, it reached the point where I would put my shoes up against the door to stop it from banging back and forth, only to find one of those shoes flung across the other side of the room by the next morning. Athena would go home to San Diego on the weekends, which meant that I was often in the apartment alone. It was then that these experiences were all the more intense. Footsteps on the carpet next to me, an overwhelming negative energy, goosebumps out of nowhere. It was a very strange sensation, and I'm afraid I cannot quite effectively describe it. My sleeping habits deteriorated, and my grades began to drop like stones. The two of us just didn't know how to deal with it, so we started to ignore it. But I can tell you that it was very difficult to ignore. On a daily basis, I would stay awake until at least 2am. Falling asleep before then, regardless of how tired I was, was an impossibility. Something would always keep me up. Some nights, I would even hear a growling sound. It was low-pitched and chilled me to the bone. To begin with, I thought it was an aeroplane, but after going outside and not being able to hear the sound, I concluded that the source was indeed inside the apartment. Matters continued to escalate. During the day in mid-April, Athena's girlfriend, Kadisha, came over. We were setting up a movie when the power went out, yet, to our surprise, the power outage was restricted to our two bedrooms and not to the rest of the apartment. So, we decided to play Uno on the carpet in the main room. While playing, all three of us heard the sound of something sliding across the tile countertop in the kitchen. I went to investigate, and found that a bottle of champagne was rolling by itself. I picked it up and placed it upright on the counter. But, as soon as I turned my back and started walking away, I heard the sound of glass shattering. I span around, and the very same bottle I had just placed on the counter had been knocked over and had shattered. Words cannot express how scared it made me, as there was nothing that could have possibly caused it to break. We were so spooked that we stayed at Kadisha's that night. The next day after my classes, I went home and discovered Athena's room had been completely torn apart. It looked like the place had been ransacked. There were clothes everywhere, items scattered, her heavy wooden desk had been completely knocked over, and the pencil tray had been pulled out all the way and dumped all over the floor. It looked like a tornado had whisked through the room. Then, all of a sudden, I looked through the glass door and saw Athena locked out on the balcony. Immediately, she started pounding on the glass. Let me in! Hurry up! Let me the hell in! I ran to open the door for her, and the first thing she said to me was this. All of this happened while I was out there. I watched some invisible force tear my room apart. We were both terrified, shaking, wanting nothing more than to get out of there and never go back. It was at this point that we decided to leave and spend the night at the sorority house. We broke our lease, and after packing our things, we never returned. Although the activity in the house never escalated to the point where we got physically hurt, the never-ceasing assault from whatever unseen presence was clearly in that apartment would not give us peace. We could no longer handle it, and were not prepared to wait and see what would happen next. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I want to thank the Paranormal Scholar for joining me in this video. It's been a huge pleasure to work with them, and is definitely a channel worth your subscription. They have many incredibly interesting videos, including in-depth research, mini documentaries and of course, paranormal stories, which I personally love watching. 
So click the link on screen now to follow me over to their channel to watch four more chilling true paranormal encounters. You won't want to miss it. As always, all comments and ratings would be very much appreciated to help the channel grow. And to keep up to date with me and the channel, follow me on Twitter at Mortis Media. But for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.